Welcome, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us, wherever you are at home, at work, wherever you are in the world. Um, and, of course, to our brilliant panellists. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Du Jensen, who's the CEO of Grundfos, who joins us from Denmark. Um, Akila Ishmael, who's the chairperson of the Orangi Pilot Project, a Karachi-based NGO, and, and Akila is in Karachi. Um, and Dr. Salmia Balasubramanya, um, an economist and research group leader under the International Water Management Institute. And Salmia joins us from Bangalore um, in India. Um, I'm Orlando von Arnsdell. I'm, I'm a filmmaker and I'm in, I'm in London. Um, uh, I had the honour of directing um, Into Dust, which is a short scripted film based on the true story of Paveen Rahman and her sister Akila, who we are very lucky to have join us today. Uh, making Into Dust was, it was a very, very special project to work on. And, and I'm deeply grateful to Akila and her family for working alongside us and the film team to, to realize this film. And um, of course, for trusting us with their story. Paveen was an activist who stood up for Karachi's poorest citizens against the city's water mafia, a, a criminal network that she exposed for ruthlessly stealing hundreds of millions of dollars of water each year. Tragically, Paveen was murdered for her work that threatened the interests of powerful groups in Karachi. While, while the film documents a local story of water theft and its consequences, the water crisis is very much a global crisis. And the film, in some ways, is a window into discussing the issue of water and solutions to try and fix water scarcity. The physical world of water is closely bound up with the social political world, with water often a key factor in managing risks such as famines, epidemics, inequalities, and political instability. It's also a major source of money and therefore influences power relationships and quests for control. Although governments have the mandate to provide necessary public water services, one in three people do not have access to safe drinking water and two out of five people do not have basic hand washing facility with soap and water, which at the moment in, in the pandemic we're in, that is, that's especially problematic. I'm excited to be here today with three people who are all working on issues of water from a variety of different angles and disciplines, and you'll hear from all of them. Um, when we talk about peace, democracy, health, education, water has an impact on all of these. Um, first, I'd like to show you a trailer for Interdust, which was bravely funded and supported by the Grundfos Foundation, and we're very thankful to them for making the film possible. Water to meet the not have water to meet the mark. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get the mark. I'm not sure if you're going to be able it's not cutting, it's rationing. Then it should be equal across the city, right? We found illegal hydrants operating in the open. Yeah. Someone is protecting them. Parveen <laughs> Rahman, known to many a as the mother of Karachi, was killed by a gunman. The police barely asked any questions at the scene. No investigation. To kill Parveen, they had to only pick up the phone and they can do it again. We all know what Parveen was doing and who benefits from corruption in this city. If you publish this report, you will make enemies and they will retaliate. Our police and politicians are in their pockets. It's a mafia. 
So let's name it. The criminals who used to deal drugs and guns are now stealing our land and water. If we don't stand up now, what will be left? Why did the Grundfos Foundation partner with a film team to, to tell this story about Paveen and Aquila? You know, what inspired you and, and what is your hope for, for the film? You know, our, our purpose here is really um, to create a, a better world than, than we inherited it. Uh, so I feel like we have an, an, an obligation and that goes all the way back to, to my grandfather, uh, Paul Lou Jensen, which actually started the company back in, in 1945. And I just happened to carry the name, same name as, as he does, uh, which I'm, I'm truly proud of. But he said uh, that, that the world is full of problems that really can be solved uh, in a better way. And, and that was some of the background for why we feel like we have an obligation really to do, to do something uh, uh, different here. Um, so, so that's first of all what inspired me and, and um, you can say uh, today Grundfos is, is the world's largest pump manufacturer but it's actually owned by a foundation and, and that foundation my grandfather established basically to, to secure and, and make sure that, that Grundfos would basically sustain itself and, and uh, continue with the best interest in, in society um, going forward. So, so, so it's about the water issue but it's certainly also around the fact that it actually it, it, it celebrates and, and, and applauds the people that dare to, to stand out and make a difference. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I'd now like to take us to Akila Ishmael. Um, as you saw a bit in the trailer, the, the, the film is based on, on a true story. Um, and um, when Paveen was, 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 was tragically murdered, um, her sister and author and social worker and electrical engineer, Akila returned to Karachi from where she was living in the Middle East to seek justice for Paveen um, and take on the running of the Orangi pilot project, um, continuing her sister's work. I, I, um, I, was, deeply, I was deeply moved by um, your story, Akila, and, and, and that of Paveen's and your work fighting for justice in a very difficult situation. Um, I, I guess as a filmmaker, I've always been drawn to people and stories that, that you know, inspire, inspire me on an individual level. Um, but your work, and, uh, your work is some of the most brave and, and, and important I, I've, I've ever come across. Um, so so may, maybe we could begin and I, I could ask you, what's the situation currently in Karachi with regards to water provision in the areas that you work in, and, and, and how is the OPP continuing um, the, the fight for, for safe access to water for, for the citizens of, of Orangi? So, you know, after Parine wrote that report on uh, which actually led to exposing the water mafia, I mean, she meticulously uh, uh, documented w what was going on. I mean, she could pinpoint where the water was stolen from and how much was being stolen and who was behind it. And can you imagine such a huge enterprise? And, you know, we used to tell her, you know, okay, do you think, you know, you, you, do you think you should do this? She said, yes, you know, my people in Orangi, they have to wait up all night every 15 days to get water. The, I mean, look at the amount of skin disease, the amount of... Uh, diseases that are there just because they don't get the water, their, their uh, 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 rightful share of the water. It's not that there is no water. People can buy water. If people can buy water, that means it's available. But you know, it is, it is the inequitable distribution of water that actually led Parveen to start documenting. And once she started documenting, she realized that 40% of the water was being stolen. And it was being stolen from the bulk, and it was being stolen from areas which would go to the poor. The rich areas, the middle income areas are still getting water. This was the thing. If there was a scarcity of water, of course, then everybody, it would be scarce for everybody. It was not. So that is what's, what she started documenting. Now, since the expo expose on water, of course, Parveen was under threat. She had, she had upended a huge empire 
of water theft. And the water that was being stolen was not given to, to domestic consumers. It was be giving, being given to big industrialists. So when this was exposed, of course, there was a lot of danger. But where was Parveen concerned with this, you know? She says, look, I, I, I mean, I never, she, she never appeared on television or on the media. She was not a mm, very famous person uh, in her words, you know, she was not. And she, the last conversation I had with her when, was two days before, on, on Monday. She was killed on Wednesday. And I said, look, Parveen, you know, you did the water and you went through so much. Now you're doing land. You know, I mean, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, I, I, the, the, the situation is so bad. Look at all the target killings that are taking place. She says, you know, she used to call me Appa. Appa is actually Urdu for, for older sister. And she said, Appa, nobody knows me. I just put my hat down and I, and I document. Why would anybody want to hurt me? Nobody knows me in Karachi, you know, and but everybody knew her, everybody knew her. The people who killed her knew her, the people who, who benefited knew her. So I think her exposure uh, uh, created this, 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 this whole, whole conversation around why is water being inequitably distributed, you know? So things started to improve. For example, where you used to get water once a month, they started getting water uh, twice a month, and now they get water one, once a week. So they store water, you know, which is a huge improvement from not having water. And you know, we are continuously, you'll be surprised, uh, just before the, before the uh, pandemic, we were getting large numbers of uh, requests to lay water lines in, the, in these areas, you know, in the Kachiabadis, in the informal settlements. Because we train the, we, we also design and we train the people to lay their own uh, lines and then connect it to the source. And it makes us so supremely happy when we get these requests that we immediately go and, and do this. You know, they lay the water lines, they connect it to the source. And uh, so if there is a shortage, there'll be a shortage everywhere in the city, not just to this area. That is what we, what we say. You give up, stop washing your car. Stop watering your lawn. Let those people have the water because it is theirs. And you can pay for water, you buy it. Why are you making them buy it? You know, this con continuous struggle. Now, I am told that I should shut up and not talk about it, but I'm not going to. Thank you, Akila. <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you very much. I, we'll, we'll come back to you in a minute. Um, Samia, ma maybe you can help bring um, some of these different strands together a bit for us. Uh, when, when people talk about the global water crisis, what, what, what do they mean? Um, and how do data, economics and ad advocacy fit into it? It's, it's, it's a tough question to answer, but let me, let me make a try out here. Uh, so Orlando, you started off by quoting some really interesting statistics about WASH. Let me add to that that recently, and just a few days ago, there was a report that was released by the Food and Agricultural Organization. And they reported that about 3.2 billion people live in areas, agricultural areas, that have extreme water shortages. Uh, these are people who are living in both rain-fed agricultural systems and irrigated agricultural systems. So the water crisis is not just related to water, sanitation, and health. It's also related to food production. And if so many people, agriculturalists, are living in areas where there are severe water shortages, it's going to affect the production of food. So we potentially have a food crisis on our hands as well. So sort of how do we bring this all together and what's this all about? What's this global, global crisis about? So there are two things that are driving the global water crisis. The first is population growth. So we have a lot of people, which means more mouths to feed, more food to produce. We need more jobs. We, mean, we need more energy. Uh, the second big driver, in a sense, behind this water problem is climate change. So very simply, what that means is because you have a rise in average global temperatures, uh, you have uh, glaciers that are melting faster than they should, sea levels that are rising, what that basically means is um, it affects patterns of rainfall. So what's happening globally is we're experiencing longer, drier spells, also called droughts, and shorter periods of more intense rainfall. So what, what the combination of population growth and climate change has done essentially is it's led to a point where water is not available in the quantities that we need it. 
It's not available in the qual quality that we need it to be. And it's not available often at the time that we need it to be, more importantly. So climate change is really affecting the timing of water. That's, that's essentially what's happening. What's interesting about this global water crisis is that it's a local global problem, by which I mean that every country in the world is experiencing this problem. Uh, but, and it's, but it's low, middle, and high income. But it's manifesting in different ways. And even within a country, different parts of the same country will experience this problem in different ways. What's worrying about the problem is that the uh, solutions that we have at hand, which are essentially either trying to augment water supply, that's often done through infrastructure, or managing the demand for water, which is often done through things like scheduling or water pricing or quotas or you know, things like that, these solutions are not going to be adequate to solve the problem, which means that the problem is here to stay. And that means that we'll have to adopt, adapt to a new way of living, and we don't know what that really entails. We're not even sure of the consequences of what this problem would be and in the different ways that this problem would manifest itself. But the one thing we already know for sure is that this global water crisis has already affected the poor and the marginalized. And as we move into the future, the poor are likely to disproportionately uh, bear uh, the burden of this problem. So let me just give you a few examples to sort of, uh, you know, stress upon how varied the problem is, but also how common the problem is. So let's go to Bangladesh, you know, a low-lying country, the southern parts of Bangladesh, highly prone to sea level ri rise and very likely will get inundated. And this is low-lying land that, uh, that has always been um, managed by building boulders and making sure that the land doesn't get inundated so, so quickly. So one of the consequences of this is that poor agricultural farmers, who are very, these are smallholders who own very small tracts of land, are only able to farm one crop a year, a rice crop, which is simply not enough to feed themselves or sell for cash. So you have a lot of domestic migration where people leave these agricultural lands and go into cities and end up often living in uh, it, you know, uh, informal settlements, Kachi Abadis, as, as Akila is talking about, where you're not going to have access to water and sanitation, where you will, you know, you are vulnerable, and if you want to get water for your basic needs, you'll have to purchase it often at pretty high prices. But it's not just low and middle income countries. I mean, think about Southern Europe. Southern Europe is going to bear the brunt of climate change in Europe because water availability in Southern Europe is going to fall. So if you're a family farm um, in, in, in Italy, and you know, it's very hard to even break even if you're producing wine and cheese now. And so your entire way of livelihood is going to get affected. Your way of living is going to get affected because it doesn't rain at the time it's supposed to rain. The humidity is not right. The moisture is not right. The grapes don't harvest properly. It affects the quality of wine. It affects your, it affects, you know, it affects your profit. So whether you're a small agriculturalist or whether you're a person who likes to drink wine, you have a lot of reason to be worried because of this global climate crisis. So you talked about what can we do and you know, what's the role of sort of different components. So one of the big things, of course, is that we need bigger data. And one of the interesting things about water is that most of the data that we have um, actually comes from satellites. So this is really big picture data, data that's applicable over very large distances. So if you want to think about solving water problems, which are in a sense local problems, this data is not going to be helpful at all. So what we really need is data from the ground, high frequency data, not just on the biophysical side, which is about how water moves and where it goes, but you also need socioeconomic data about what do people do when they face water water shortages. Um, you know, what are the challenges that they're facing? What are the what are the what are the what are the methods and the techniques that they're already adapting to change? Because people are not going to sit around sitting, twiddling their thumbs. They're obviously doing something. So we need better data. Uh, what does economics do for us? Um, economics is the science of trade-offs. So because the situation is here to stay, we're going to have to make some tough trade-offs. So what are the trade-offs that we as a society are willing to make that we can live with? How do we balance efficiency with distribution, equity, and justice? These are the sorts of questions that economics as a discipline can answer. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I mean, your, your sort of your last point talking about solutions brings me on to, to the next question, um, and, and I sort of want to pose it to all of you um, in, a, in a different way. Um, what what is something you see as a solution from where you sit, a way of tackling water insecurity when the issues differ so greatly in in many areas, governance, collective action, innovation. Um, 
What do you think needs to happen, whether you are someone directly affected by lack of access to water or someone affected by flooding, by a polluted river in your neighbourhood, or you mistakenly think water will never be an issue for you because you can turn in your tap and clean water pours out. Pours out. And maybe I could start to, to you, Paul. Um, is, is innovation in manufacturing, water reuse, treatment, solar pumps, partnerships, raising awareness, it, is, is that... Is that, a is that a solution that, that you see for the future? So as, as Salmiya said, you know, we have situations with floods and melting glaciers, uh, rising seas, intense storms and whatnot w with the climate. And then you have areas and, um, and uh, it's actually all over the world where you have uh, areas, cities in, in the brink of actually just going dry. So major, major water scarcity around the world um, there's, this is impacting, of course, millions of, uh, of, of, of people. And, and, and how, how can we deal with that? And I think one, one way, or, or at least one point that's, that's important to, to, to state here, that may not be, be obvious to all, but, but having on one side, having uh, the, the climate situation, and then one on the other side, you have, so to say, the water side of things. The, these two things cannot be seen separately. They need to be combined. Uh, cannot be in silos. They, they need to simply uh, fit together and we need to find solutions for both of them um, and, and, and if and when possible, basically uh, at, at, the same, at the same time here. Um, so we need to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the, the carbon footprint. There's absolutely uh, no doubt on, um, on, on, on that. But, uh, but we also need to understand better how do we at the same time then, uh, then, then manage these water challenges that we actually are seeing uh, across the world? Um, and, and, and there are ways, there, there are definitely ways um, to, to start uh, solving these. And, and, and one way would be to, to adapting and, and building uh, codes, for instance, for, for various uh, extreme weather events. Uh, the fact that we, uh, we can also Built various flood defenses, uh, which is uh, which is extremely important, and actually built more around the strength of water efficiency is is extremely important here, and 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 the solving of this, um, it, it's not just kind of us here, you know, it's it, it's everybody, it's it's around governments, they play a huge role here, um, it is around businesses, it's around the local communities but it's actually about everybody. And, and all of these uh, uh, very important stakeholders, they all play a very, very important role in order for this actually uh, to, to come together. And, and it's only by doing that, I think that we will have a, a solid chance to actually save and conserve both the, the, um, the, the climate side, but certainly at the same time also then, then the, the, the waterfront and save that, that precious uh, resource that, that we have in front of us. So we all need to come together in order to, to solve that, uh, that issue. Th th thank you, Paul. Um, Akila, if I, could, if I could turn to you and, and um, may maybe you could speak about the, the local training programs that the OPP runs and, and how, how you see their role in, in safeguarding against water scarcity in the future. You know, we do need uh, knowledge-based advocacy, not just rhetorical, and it shouldn't be only big picture. So, you know, what we did, uh, what OPP did, and what Parveen is, did, and what we are continue to do, is to create that knowledge base, which we empower the communities with. We tell them, okay, look, this is, this is possible. So, and this is how you can ad advocate the government, because this is, this is, this is available. So, you know, it is actually what we do is knowledge-based advocacy. And because we do knowledge-based advocacy, we train people in order to understand what development is. What their, and we don't do it by just imposing on them. We first, and you know, the point that people are not just sitting, sitting around twiddling their thumbs. They are looking for ways and they are, you know, they are striving to, to uh, to, to get a better life for themselves, for their families, for their children, for, for their elderly, for their animals, for their trees, for, for nature. You know, and it is the poor who live off nature more than the rich do. It is so easy to bring up a mega project. You know, 
you just bring in, you, you, you sit on your drawing board and you make this huge scheme based on whatever knowledge you have and whatever data you have and then come in and, 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 and impose this. This is what, what people like uh, 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 the World Bank, for example, does. You know, they've come with huge solutions on the drawing board. And when they have implemented it, there have been huge disasters. Bajaye mega projects hi. Zarurat hai mega management ki. Mega management mein aapko bahut zehen chahiye, bahut coordination chahiye. I know the, uh, we've had huge dams. Uh, we have had the outfall projects. Uh, we've had uh, uh, drainage projects. And they have been, they have simply added to the problem. So, you know, I think the world has to now look towards s small local solutions and, and then build up from there. And these are all available. You don't have to invent, you know, you don't have to invent anything. They are there. You just have to understand and respect those solutions, I think, in order to, uh, to be able to make any change at all whether it's in agriculture. And, and you know, I just wanted to also uh, tell you about this fabulous, uh, you've seen our farm. We do water recycling, you know, on a small scale. We, we, we have a small one acre farm and, and the crop is fabulous and low cost. And we do water recycling at a very low cost because we have these EMSTUs, which are effective microorganism sewage treatment units. And this was developed by a university in Pakistan adapted for us and uh, it costs 30,000 rupees but it can it can give you enough enough treated water for one acre so you know but uh, you know these are the solutions that have to be advocated and uh, I think the go our government at least the new government is catching on to this because of the number of uh, uh, the number of areas and the number of places thanks to to Paul that we are able to access with our solutions, you know, with our uh, training. As you said, okay, what do we train people into? We train people to look at development. We, we, okay, what is the development they require, not what they are told they need. And the first thing we do is we document what's on the ground. So our training programs are actually uh, all over Pakistan we do this. Every Kachi Abadi we do this. And the huge number of young people who come to us to get this, this training. It is a youth-based training, we do that. So uh, we, there are formal parts to it and there are informal parts to it. The informal parts are the best, actually. Because if, we, if, if OPP-based uh, designs are being uh, made in a lane, it is people around who want to get trained. We train masons to our view. Way way of, uh, uh, of laying lines, for example, water lines or sewage lines. So again, our training is also community-based, you know. Okay, we take them into the community and we make them learn what is, what, what is it they need. It, it is the whole basis of our ideology. And I think uh, uh, we have managed to turn, I think, a, a, a settlement of 0.8 million people when, when OPP started, I think now it is a thriving township of 2.1 million people with schools, with clinics, with government schools, with government hospitals, and it has been given a recognition as a formal settlement now. We continue to call it a Kachi Abadi because, because that the name sticks, but it is a, a, a formal settlement of, a formal settlement with upward mobile people. I mean, you know, because their economic conditions also also become better when they have better health. And one of the main things is their access to, to uh, number one, to water, and number two, for disposal of uh, the sewage. So both of these they make themselves. And then the, uh, the government is told, okay, look, people have invested. People have done their part. Now you do your part. People can't do the community. You know, people can only do community level work. You do the city level work. You do the, the town level work. And you know, we have forged this partnership. And I think this, in our opinion, is the perfect people government partnership. You know, where the government is not partner, uh, partnering with, with um, corporations and big IFIs, etc., but it is partnering with the people. Uh, f fascinating he hearing, uh, you know, your, your, your sort of 
vision on things very much from uh, the, the, the voice of the community um, and, and Paul from you about innovation and efficiency. I, Sammy, it comes to you again to sort of try and <laughs> bring things together. And I think there's a missing piece here about, about governance and a accountability. Um, uh, maybe, a bit, but tell me from your point of view um, how you feel. Sure. Um, I think both Paul and, and Akila have uh, sort of touched on a number of key points. So the first thing is, I think, what needs to be done a little differently when it comes to sort of water and indeed just development in general is we need to sort of mainstream the question of equity a bit more than we have in the past. You know, a lot of resource management is usually around questions of efficiency, which is very important because the resource is scarce. But to give to, to sort of give an example or to maybe maybe use a sort of a parable, you have a certain set of resources and you want to make as much pie as you can from it, which is a good thing because there's more pie to go around. But another way of looking at it is to say, how do we spread this resource around so that more people can make pie and so that there is also more pie in the end? And I think you need a balance of those two approaches, especially when it comes to water. I mean, uh, just thinking about it from just an efficiency perspective will miss the problem of distribution and equity. The fact that uh, the water crisis, and, and by the way, the water crisis is the climate crisis. So, and that is going to affect the poor and the marginalized the most. It already has, we know that. And so we really need to bring equity back in. And of course, one way of doing that is to understand what people are already doing on the ground, understand what's happening, and then link bigger policy and programs in a way that complements what's going, going on at the grassroots level so that you actually end up having more effective programming, uh, what we call more bang for buck. It's a good way to do that. It's a good way to mobilize community action and what's happening at the larger level in a process of dialogues to make sure that it all kind of streamlines, you know, in a way. It's easier said than done, but when done can actually yield some really good results. Um, Akila talked about uh, building capacity. Let me actually expand that. It's not just the capacity of communities that needs to be built. It's the capacity of those in government and governance that needs to be built. So if you, uh, go to a water board or an irrigation department in, by the way, any part of the world, and this is not just true of low and middle income countries, it's equally true of high income countries. Um, if you, uh, you know, you graduated from, you know, with your degree, say 10 years ago, the chances are that at the moment you do not have the knowledge that you need in order to be able to do your job more effectively. So how can we, how can governments globally uh, think better about making sure that their staff and their decision makers are, have access to this information, particularly on climate change, which is very rapidly changing. And how do, they, how do we make sure that these people have that information as is relevant to their job, so that they understand what is the implications of that as and when they do their job. So one way to do that might be to better encourage and incentivize uh, different agencies and governments to connect better with agricultural universities or what in the United States, for example, are called land-ground institutions, because they are the ones who do a lot of this research. And how can there be a fruitful dialogue and exchange between those who do the science and generate the knowledge and those who need the knowledge in order to actually use it and make it work on the ground? Uh, and how do we incentivize that from happening? Because I don't think that happens enough. The good news is that the CGIAR, which is what I work for, and the, and the International Water Management Institute is part of the CGIAR, actually does, does do that. That's exactly what we do. Um, and I think that's ne that, that needs to happen across the board. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important is to diversify how uh, government agencies, especially those that manage water resources, are staffed. Uh, if you walk into any water resource board anywhere, you're going to see lots of engineers and you'll see lots of hydrologists and you'll see lots of remote sensing experts. You'll very rarely find a sociologist or an anthropologist or an economist. And I think you need to bring these disciplines in in order to widen the conversation because it's not just about supplying water. It's also about understanding how people use water or for that matter, don't use it. So Mia is right. We have experienced it. We have worked with government organizations, the, the ones who manage water and sewerage. And, and they can be changed. They can be changed if you include them in your dialogue and in your uh, work. And we feel that People who, who are from the city and who love the city would use these, use these uh, um, 
uh, use these uh, uh, methods of getting development done by again, again, it is again, it is uh, going to the the people and from the people to the government. And I will, I, I, I want to emphasize again that there are in all these in water especially the solution lies in the government partnering with the people. One of the challenges that climate change is actually is kind of bringing about is that it actually becomes really hard to plan for the future. So do you plan for a flood? Do you plan for a drought? Do you plan for both? Which the same area experiences every year and then there are good years in the middle. So one of the challenges of putting into place uh, heavy infrastructure is that you don't know what to plan for. You might end up putting in too much in which case the project becomes extremely expensive or you might end up not putting in enough in which case the project is not effective. So one of the things that we need to explore better and that and this is where even the science can perhaps do a bit better because even we don't understand this enough is looking at what we call no low regret or no regret options. So things like for example uh, what is the role for more traditional and indigenous knowledge that has been used by communities to manage incidences of water scarcity? What is their role in the current times? How can they be adapted or scaled in a way that is contextually relevant and makes sense? Most sciences, especially you know, the engineering and uh, you know, sort of the more technical sciences, so to speak, are very male dominant, and if I may say so globally, very white male dominant as well. And that needs to change. Um, there needs to be a diversity in, in, in who we work with. We need to bring in different voices. Because even in the sciences, the way you conceptualize a problem or what you think is a problem will depend upon the circumstances in which you were, brought, you were, you were born and brought up. We're all a pro product of our circumstances. And so one of the things that really does also need to happen, especially on the science side, is, is how do we bring in more people? For example, technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's, this is still a very male dominant field and that's gonna change the future you know, in the way that we do so many things. Where are the voices of the women here? What are the women scientists doing? How many are there? Uh, because I think, just I think there is a gendered uh, sort of perspective to this and, 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 and people come in with, with those different perspectives and so how do we kind of do better on that front? I think this, this, is, this is going to be key really you know moving forward because the only way we can tackle the problem of distribution and equity at one level is to bring in those different voices too because we're all seeing things from our own perspective. I think one of the things that this film will do is bring in that you know give women Women bring that, that right perspective. Parveen did, and her organization did. As you know, I'm an engineer. I, I'm an electrical engineer, gone bad. Uh, but I was, when I was studying, I was the only girl, but 300 boys. You know, I liked the attention, but, but you know, I mean, for a long, but now, when I started teaching, there were more women coming in. So, so, you know, I mean, it is changing, but we need to drive it. And I think women can do it only. Women can drive other women into the folds, take them into the fold of uh, understanding, of contributing, of giving them an opportunity to contribute. I, I just wanted to, to throw back to Paul and, and ask about the role of the private sector in, in things, because I think that's, uh, that's, that's a clearly, uh, can play a really important role too. It, it, it's pretty common here in the Western world and, and to actually have the access to monitor how much water you actually use and thereby you are actually empowered also not just to, to kind of open up the tap and leave it running but actually empowered to, to optimize and only kind of take, take what, you, what you need and, and constantly bring the, the amounts down and, and that, that is possible with technologies to optimize uh, kind of water on demands um, with, with various uh, systems. Um, and you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of predictive uh, maintenance also possible uh, in, in the whole water infrastructure, as, as both of you are, are said, there's, there's a need with that, no matter if you have too little or, or, or too much, uh, so to say, and, and, and maybe just to throw out a, a statistics also uh, from, from, so to say, the, the, the Western part here and, and and a lot of the cities, uh, some of the, the major cities as you, as you know them, uh, maybe Amsterdam or, or London or, you know, it, it, it's like 
maybe you're not aware, but, but 60 to 70% of the water that is actually produced really never reaches the, the, the end user or, or the factories that are, that are here to use it. it, it it's actually wasted. And, um, and, 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 and that is, of course, uh, really, really a, a, a shame. And, um, but, but there are opportunities here also. You know, it, it, uh, it of course, disappears with, with, uh, from, from wear and tear with bad piping, uh, with maybe worn out pumps and valves, uh, et cetera, that, that's there. But there are systems now available where you can actually track and measure where are the leaks, where do we need to go in and, and, and help do this. Because, you know, this is in a, in a Western city, everybody just kind of take it for granted that, that water is there, but there's so much that is disappearing, just flushing in, in, into the ground. But again, we're using a lot of CO2 to actually get it there, but that's, that's also uh, a, 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 a big uh, problem. So, so there's a solution um, for, for that uh, in, in, in place and in order to avoid all, all the leakages. Um, and, and, then, and then, as both of you have touched upon, also around the, the flooding side. Flooding is a, is, a, is a major topic here. And in many places, it takes quite, quite an extensive and, and enormous amount of, of development uh, because of the infrastructure. You know, we, we need to guide the water into the, to the right direction. And then, uh, as, um, as, uh, as Akila also said, then sometimes, you know, you predict wrong. And uh, you have these surprises uh, that actually uh, come up here, and, and it causes it causes uh, major forms of, of contamination of, of the water, which is which is uh, deadly, right? It brings deadly diseases with it, and 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 another statistics that that I'm sure you're all all aware of, but it's super scary, and that's why I'm also repeating the fact that we have more than 700 people, uh, uh, children, 700 children die every single day, day under the age of five because of these issues here that are, that are water related with, uh, with the contamination. So it, it is actually possible even with, with floods to actually, and, and we do that in, and many do that in disaster areas where you actually have a possibility to take the, the, the flooded water um, and, and uh, disinfect and use and make drinking water on the spot uh, and in, in, in various areas where you really have, have people in, uh, in need. And, uh, and, and that is for sure uh, possible to do. And, and we should do a lot more of that because you can say th that water is as good as anything. And you can use that for many things, including drinking water on the spot when it's treated uh, correctly. And then, and then what was also touched about, but but the recycling of water, the reuse of water is, is uh, very, very important. Um, and, and here again, uh, um, th there, are, there are technologies uh, out there around this, um, this circular system here uh, in order to, not, uh, to, to avoid uh, water loss or water damages uh, out there. Um, and, um, and, and here again, we basically all need to, to to come together with these solutions here. So, so all the stakeholders I mentioned before, but it's also funding. And then I think uh, you both said it clearly. It, it is the governments working here together with with, with the people. Uh, it 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 for sure is. And and in in many Western parts also is the government working directly here with the private sector uh, as well to to get this done because it's it's available. Um, and maybe then, then the last thing, um, not, not out of context, but we have a pandemic uh, going on right now uh, at the same time, right? And, and here, I think we, we, we all aware how, how, how water here in this context is also an extreme precious resource that, that we then need to, uh, to, to keep and, and, and maintain. And it has really proven to be a, a vital form of, of, of survival also during the pandemic. And, uh, yeah, we, we are so fortunate also to be able to actually help in many, many places where, where water has become an issue and where a lot of communities and, and rural areas have shut down, but where we are still able and, and capable to deliver uh, water into that to, to sustain as many lives, but also not only short term, but also long term for sustainable future for millions of, uh, of, of people. And, and um, again, let's protect it together.
Thanks, everyone. I, you know, I, you, the, the three of you are all sort of, your worlds are, are surrounded with, 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 with dealing and talking about water and, and fixing problems on the ground. I, I, I'm, I guess I'm an outsider um, and, and I, I, I'm becoming an insider because of this project. But, I, you know, if I was to, to, to put my hand up as a filmmaker and say one of the, one of the solutions I see is, is to make everybody in the world aware of the preciousness of water. Because for sure there are parts of the world where clearly every day to get water is a battle and everyone there understands implicitly the importance of every drop. There are other parts of the world where that is not the case. Um, and and I, I would see, I think film, our film ha has, has a role possibly to play in that. And I, you know, I've always believed that film can be an effective medium for inspiring change um, for a few reasons. I, I guess firstly, in the way it can build an empathy bridge between people from different parts of the world, um, in the way it can communicate a complicated issue in a short amount of time and in an emotionally engaging way. And, and, and finally, in a way it can expose a problem or a situation that has been hidden from a mass audience. And I suppose that's where I'd, I'd like to think our film can, can play a role. Um, and also, you know, I, I, I hope I hope we can use our film to support Paveen's legacy. That, that's really important. And other community advocates around the world um, and address issues of water insecurity and solutions at the community, national and international level. Um, I, maybe I could throw that back to, to all three of you and, and say you could leave us with a message, maybe one of hope, um, about what you, what you hope people might take away from from, from our film or, or also from this panel? And maybe I could begin with, with you, Samia. <laughs> um, I, think, um, I, I, think that, I think the important thing here is that the water crisis is already many people's day-to-day -day problem. And if it's something that's not on your radar, it's because you haven't experienced it yet. But there will come a point in time when it will be your problem. And so now is the time to sort of, you know, we may still have some time in order to limit the damage that it does. Uh, sorry, this is not as optimistic perhaps as you thought it was, Orlando, apologies for that, but, uh, but you know, being a, sort of a bit of a realist out here. Um, uh, but I think there are things that can be done and certainly can be done better and we can certainly do much better on the grounds of justice and equity, which, which is really what this is going to come down to at the end of the day. Uh, we'll all end up, uh, you know, having to face the consequences of this, but can we do it in a manner that is equitable and just? And I think on that front, there's a lot that can be done, a lot that science, advocacy, that the private sector can play a role in, for example, in terms of working with stakeholders, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, working with people that you directly, you know, e either procure from or, or do things with so that, so that, you know, there's just more responsible and more equitable and more just use of this resource. So I, I think there's a lot that can be done on that front, uh, and I think we should be doing it. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. What 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 do you hope um, people can take away from from this panel and 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 the film? We we are Grundfos as as a company and, and the foundation. You know, we want to make a a difference uh, to the world. There's absolutely no doubt, and and uh, we are set in the world to improve. Um, not only the uh, the water issues, but also uh, all around the energy efficiency level, and, and really create a, a better world out there. And I, and I think we are we are there's a long way to go, but I think we are we are making progress here together with with a lot of other uh, fantastic stakeholders. Don't give up out there. Uh, we can do this together. And I think the way that that Praveen and now with, with Aquila forefronting uh, OPP and, and what they do is a fantastic example of an engagement and what can really happen and I was truly inspired by by both of you to hear your stories um, and but also how we can we can solve these issues uh, here uh, together so with that um, I'm just truly excited uh, that uh, we can be part of this project thank you Paul um, Akila I, f I find maybe a final a final word from you um, what hopes do you have that, that the film might play or, or that people watching this today can, can take away? Um, you know, Praveen used to always say that, yes, there are many problems in the world. There are bomb blasts, there are Taliban, there are, you know, all kinds of atrocities being committed. But she said that there are everywhere people, aspire, you know, working for a better life, for, to, to attain a better life. It is this that we have to look at. 
It is this that we have to look at with eyes of respect. And this is what will give us hope and optimism, that yes, there are people all over the world who, although faced with such great odds, you know, odds that we would probably succumb to, but they still continue to persevere. And there is one other point that I want to make about Parveen, which gives us so much hope, and that is that she believed in the power of women. She believed in that completely, because she said, okay, you know, when I take, when I work with a man, and I teach him something, when I train him to do something, and when I build an organization with them, they do it to attain power. But when I do it with women, they do it to better their communities. So I think, <coughs> uh, uh, the, the, I, I think the film has touched upon the fact that women are very important to, to this whole uh, uh, way, uh, to betterment of life, you know, because it is they who are affected the most, I think, especially in, in low-income communities. They're the ones who are affected the most. And, but they, the solution also lies with them. And if you can get women to, to understand and to, to, to inspire, if this film does that, and this film shows that you don't have to be uh, uh, afraid, that you can, you can dare to be Parveen, you can dare to be Parveen by simply asking for, uh, for equality and justice. And you know, and that is why we continue to strive for justice for her, because she did it for everyone. She, and, so we, we continue to do that, and I think that is her legacy, that one must always work towards getting this justice. And you know, like Dr. King said, Dr. Martin Luther King said, that the arc of the, uni the, arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. And that is, that I think was a driving force in Parveen's worldview, and, and we are trying to follow that. And I don't know, I mean, it's a very, uh, uh, she, she followed a very, uh, I mean, she was so supremely happy with what she was doing. There was never any time when she would give up. But I sometimes feel it's too much, I can't do this, you know. But, but then I, I think of her, and she would say, no, really, really, Appa, you think they can't do it? Of course they can do it, just, just look at it this way or that way, you know, to convince. So, so, you know, she's there. There's not a nanosecond that I'm not aware of her. And, uh, and I think there are many, many people like me who have worked with her, her team who you have met, and uh, people in the community who, who called her Baji, which means big sister. So you have these 80-year-old men calling her Baji, which means older sister. So, you know, her legacy lives on, and it will continue because it was so based on such a simple truth that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice.